Hi all and welcome to my talk. I am Cecilia Boschini and I'm going to talk about efficient post-quantum SNARKs for RCs and RWE and their applications to privacy. This is joint work with Janka Menisch, Max Alciankin and Nicolas Spooner. So the core of our paper are zero-knowledge proofs, which are protocols between a prover and a verifier that allow the prover to prove that he knows a secret to the verifier without actually revealing the secret. Mm, for example, the proof if we have like a public instance X and language, then the prover could prove to the verifier that he knows a witness to the public instance without actually revealing the witness W. And how this would work, this would entail a couple, like some, some a number of interactions at the end of which the verifier will uh, output zero or one depending on whether the proof has been accepted so the verifier is convinced that the prover knows the secret or not and we of course require some properties security properties from these protocols we want them to be correct so if w exists and the prover knows it then the verifier accepts uh, we want them to be zero knowledge so we want to make sure that the verifier cannot recover any information about w besides the fact that the prover knows it and we want them to be sound to prevent like a cheating prover to com uh, wrongly convince, falsely convince the verifier. Uh, however, all like the amount of interaction between the prover and the verifier might be restricted in some applications, and that's why we uh, we have non-interactive zero knowledge proofs, which are proof where that only have one round of interaction where the prover essentially sends the transcript to the verifier, which then verifies it and outputs zero one. And these can also be um, asynchronous. And in particular, we require from this proof not soundness, but something called special soundness. So we want uh, that it's possible to extract a valid witness from two accepting transcripts for the same public uh, instance X. And why we are interested in this is because they're very useful when in protocols, when user have, users have to prove that they have some attribute, for example, they are older than 18 without revealing it. So they preserve anonymity very well. And for example, we can consider what I, I've called anonymous signing protocols. So all those protocols such as ring signatures, group signatures, et cetera, that where there is a group of signers that are allowed to sign, but when it's not really important to know which of them has signed, just that it's one of the, uh, one, a member of the group. These kind of protocols all have an issuer, then users, and then a verifier entity that later on will verify the signature. And in the more naive, or for the purpose of this talk, we're gonna consider a very naive construction where we only use signatures and uh, no interactive zero knowledge proofs and maybe encryption, but just, uh, we will just mention it. And the idea is that um, when the user is, will, joins, sends, he can send an identity to the issuer or receives an identity from the issuer that is also signed by the issuer. And the signing key is secret and only known to the issuer so that not all users can join or to join all users have to go through the issuer. And then later on, when the verifier sends the message to the user to be signed, then the user can use the credentials he has obtained from the issuer to actually produce a signature. And why we use zero knowledge proofs? Because it's possible using the Fiat Shamir heuristic to convert them from a proof to an actual signature. And as you can see, the user here is sending the proof and a small c, which is a ciphertext, because if we are considering an anonymous signing protocol where anonymity is revocable. So at some point, for example, in the case of a suspected misbehavior, uh, we might assume that there exists an entity that can then open the signature and check who actually signed. But for the purpose of, we will see that this is the case, for example, for group signatures, but, and for now, let's just ignore it. So uh, we're interested in, in doing um, anonymous signing protocols for lattices, based on lattices. So first of all, we will need a signature. And a signature, we chose Boyan's signature which works as follows. So given a small m, which is a message, we want to generate a signature. And a signature is a short vector f. And how we do that, we first take the public key 
and we generate a, the verification matrix, which here is denoted as AM here. And we can do that using just the message and the, pub, the public key. At that point, it's possible to extend the trapdoor the, um, the trap to a trapdoor for M, the signing key to a trapdoor for AM, and then generate the secret vector S such that a s is equal to a m s is equal to u where u is also part of the public key and then verification is very easy because the message is public and so the verifier could just reconstruct a m and check that a m times s which is the signature is equal to u and the signatures we use by n signature because it doesn't use hashes so for example if not a hessian sign kind or uh, it doesn't use fiat shamir heuristic so running a proof so proving that the user knows the message and the signature only entails proving no, knowledge of the solution of some system. And in particular, so what, what would this exactly entail? Uh, this essentially would entail proving that we know S, in particular S1 and S2, we split it for clear of explanation, and that we know an M, which are both small, so which have like infinity norm less um, smaller than a given bound, and that satisfy this equation. And a, b, and g are part of the public uh, the public key, and also u. A, b, and g can be considered as um, as matrix matrices for now, and u as a vector. Or if we are working on set q or uh, they can be considered as uh, vectors of polynomials if we're working with the ideal lattices. And so what, what, what the result of converting this in an actual equation, we would get that we need to prove that we know S1, S2, and M such that A times S1 plus B times S2 plus M, G, S2 is equal to U mod Q. And there have been attempts to do it. And we, uh, I also have a work uh, a paper with Yanka Manish and Gregory Nevin on this using Schnorr proofs. And the problem of Schnorr proofs is that they allow, uh, so they work as follows. The prover will sample like a masking vector y and compute a times y. And this would be t and would send t to the verifier. At that point, the verifier would sample a challenge and send the challenge back to the prover. Then the prover will compute a vector which is hiding the secret S as the masking vector Y plus the challenge C times the secret vector S and send Z to the verifier. And then the verifier would check if the norm of C is small and that the verification goes through. And in particular, if we want to guarantee re uh, zero knowledge, we add rejection sampling. So we choose uh, the probability the the masking vector y according to a particular probability distribution so that it hides when when we add c s to y the resulting c is hiding the vector s but still has small norm and then we can um, make it non-interactive using generating the, the challenge using a hash function now it has been it's proven that the prover can cheat with a probability one at least one over c uh, one over the cardinality of the challenge set um, hence we require for the prover to re uh, to prevent this that the proof has to be repeated multiple times so that the prover actually cannot uh, has a smaller pr uh, probability of of cheating and this is actually an issue because it requires so if we want to avoid repeating the message, the proof, we need to choose a larger set of challenges. And this, it has been shown that so far this has impacted soundness. So at the end, what the prover can, all, uh, can actually prove is that he knows a secret uh, vector S such that A times S is equal to C times U, where C somehow depends on the challenges. And this is not exactly the original relation we wanted to prove that this relation. So uh, these proofs actually don't work. And on top of it, we have another problem. So when we, as we said before, we want to prove uh, that we know S1, S2, M, 
such that AS1 plus BS2 plus MGS2 is equal to U mod Q. And now the first, uh, let's say the left side, the left hand side is, can be proven with Schnorr proofs up until here, up until BS2. But then the problem is how to prove that the part, how to deal with the part where that has a multiplication of secrets. And we show in a, in a previous paper that this actually requires a blow up in the dimension and more complicated proof to do it. In this work, we actually decided to change the kind of proof we're using and resolve to use Aurora. Aurora is a SNARK that was published at Eurocrypt in 2019 by Ben Sasson et al. and allows to prove knowledge of uh, the solution of an R1CS relation which is the one represented here. So you're given matrices A, B, and C, uh, which have coefficients in FQ, and a public v, uh, W, which is uh, a vector, a column vector, and then uh, the secret is the polynomial, uh, the vector V. And V is such that A times one V W, and multiplied component-wise with B times one V W is equal to C, times one VW. And the bright side of this is that it supports arithmetic on, in ZQ, so we don't need to deal with the modular reduction. It allows to deal with product, products of secret thanks to the fact that it proves then the relation contains this uh, component one multiplication as we will see later. And the proof length is, um, log is the proof is very small, which is, uh, which is what we were looking for as lattices uh, usually uh, lattice elements are pretty big and then we, uh, they usually yield pretty big proofs. So the, to use Aurora though, it's not uh, very clear how to adapt it, at least at the beginning was not very clear how to adapt it to lattices. And we will now show how to use Aurora in, the lattice, in a lattice environment in particular when considering ideal lattices. So lattices over the ring RQ, which is ZQ of X over X to the N, the ideal generated by X to the N plus one, which essentially contains uh, polynomials of degree N minus one with coefficients in ZQ. And we're gonna show how to use Aurora to prove that given a public A, we know secrets that sum to A. Given a public P, we know secrets that sum to P that are multiplied, uh, whose product is P. And given a public F, its, uh, its norm, the infinity norm is smaller than a public bound. So we're gonna use it for addition, multiplication, and shortness. And this will be, as you can clearly see, this is enough to use Aurora in the context of lattices for any uh, relation from RCs to RW, and in particular for Boolean signature. Now, um, why can we use Aurora is because, because a, like a listener could actually think, well, we are talking about polynomials now, Aurora is working with elements in the queue. How can we, uh, how can you, we use Aurora in this case? Well, it's possible to construct, to represent polynomials with vector in many different ways. And in particular, we're gonna consider the number theoretic transform, which is, um, which is particularly useful because it yields component-wise addition and multiplication. So if I have f times g, then the, the product of f times g uh, is, can be represented through the number theoretic transform as the component-wise product multiplication of the representation of f and g, which is great because at this point, we can see why Aurora is actually a very powerful tool in this case. But let's start with addition. So we wanna prove that given a secret F and a secret G, their sum is equal to A, where A is public. How are we gonna do it? We're gonna consider the number theoretic transform of the three um, of the three of them. And then, so we're gonna define A have, as having a minus TC, the transpose is just for, for dimensions reason, as the first column. And then the identities in the other part that multiply uh, the secret vector. And as secret vector V, we're gonna set T, uh, TF and TG. 
And w is really not important. We're going to always multiply it times zero, so it doesn't matter which value it has. And then the rest, I'm going to set. Uh, so on, now on the left hand side of the component wide multiplication, we have what's represented here. So minus tc, which always gets multiplied, then multiplied by the one, and then plus tf and plus tg. And then on this side, we want to have one so that this times one it actually yields the, the right left hand side of the, of the equality. So we're going to set the matrix B as having one, uh, the first column uh, equal, uh, containing all one com components equal one, and then the rest just uh, the rest of the matrix is just zeros. And then the matrix C, given that on the right hand side of the inequality, of the equality we want to have zero, C, the matrix C is just the zero matrix. Now for multiplication, so we want to prove that F times G is equal to P. Well, P is public and the other two are secret. So this is actually quite easy because it's enough, considering the same secret vector where W is a public value and it could, could be set to zero. It has no impact on the proof. We're going to now set the matrix A as having zero in the first component because we want to neutralize the one, which is there by, because of the structure of the R1CS relation. And then the identity matrix is multiplied the uh, F and zero, zeros are multiplying the rest so that we eliminate this part of the vector. And on this side, now we have just TF. So the representation of F through the number theoretic transform. Now, on the other side, on the right hand side of the component wise multiplication, we're going to do the same, but with respect to G. So we're going to set the matrix B equal to zero in every component that multiply the element one or the representation of F in the secret factor. And then put the identity in the part that multiplies G and zero in the part that multiplies W. So now we have on this, on the left hand side of the component wise multiplication, the representation of F, and on the right hand side of the, comp the component-wise multiplication, we have the representation of G. And this has to be equal to the representation of C. And to do that, we just set the matrix C as uh, having in the first column the, comp the entity representation of C, so that this gets multiplied by one and zero in the rest. Finally, shortness was slightly more complicated, but uh, we used the trick exploiting the fact that we already know how to use Aurora for addition and multiplication. So the idea is to prove that um, the representation uh, TF of F actually can be represented in binary using power of two, two up to two um, raised to the, um, up to two, two to log beta, essentially, where beta is the bound. And to do that, we will just need to prove that we know some zero one coefficients such that the binary representation minus the coefficients of f are actually is actually equal to zero. And this can be done very easily by proving these two relations, which only make use of addition and multiplication, so they can be converted to our one CS. Con uh, to an R1CS relation. And the first one essentially proves that the, the B, I, J are either zero or one. And the second one proves that the, uh, the representation is actually a binary representation of the polynomial F. And the fact that there are two um, factors here is to deal with the fact that uh, we use the representation of ZQ as numbers from uh, minus q to the one over the q minus one over two to plus q minus one over two, thus having to deal with a plus or minus uh, sign. Good. Now, finally, we can see how we can use Aurora to build a group signature uh, scheme, which is the kind of signature where with revocable anonymity, so where the signer will have to, when he signs, he also adds an encryption of the identity M. And in particular, as an encryption here, we use just normal Ringle W encryption. And we show that actually the group signature we obtained is way more efficient than the previous one. In particular, we confronted it, we compared it with um, um, the paper by Delpino et al. at CCS 2018. 
where we actually uh, get higher security level and a shorter signature, even if the number of users is uh, the, the user set is very small. But the reason for it is mostly uh, that we uh, needed to guarantee a higher security level. We wanted to guarantee a higher security level. And on top of it, there are two flavors of the group signature, one that, and one of them, the, the second, the one in the third row, actually protects even if the issuer is corrupted. And this is all from my side. Thank you very much.